They're here. So yeah, I mean, at first, I just didn't know what to do. At first, Daddy was confused. I didn't know it was going to affect people in Nassau and Freeport. And then I told him, it was just the first three numbers. Our new phone numbers have arrived, but there is no need to be afraid. Only the first three numbers have changed. The new numbers are in effect now. Good evening, Bahamas. You are tuned in to MB12 Broadcasting from Cable 12 Studios on Robinson Road. Coming up tonight in news, a Bahamian group applies for a casino license. A former woman police constable's bail application denied. Plus, the Bahamas removed from a U.S. Trade Representative's watch list. We've got those stories and so much more. I'm Bwani Tude and NB12 starts now. Topic news tonight, Bahamians might not be able to gamble in local casinos. However, there's no law that says they cannot own or operate one. And as many people call for equal opportunity for all Bahamians, chartered accountant and former spokesman for the Vote Yes campaign, Philip Galanis, says a group of businessmen hope to do just that. Paige McCartney explains. Amid the ongoing controversy regarding the proposed gaming bill, MB12 can confirm that a group of Bahamian businessmen are in the process of applying for a casino license, which would mean if granted, Bahamians would own and operate a business that Bahamians can't participate in. Golana said he represents that group applying for the casino license and expects it would make an announcement on the matter within the next week or so. He said at least one part of the application has been submitted and the group is in the process of completing all of the necessary paperwork. Golana said he believes the Bahamian investors have a good chance of getting approval. Oh, I think it's absolutely feasible, just as feasible as it is for Atlantis or Bahama to be approved to operate a casino. I think it's feasible for any number of Bahamian groups to be, uh, to be able to participate in gaming. I, I feel very strongly about that. I don't think that there is any area of economic activity in this country, legitimate, area, uh, le legitimate economic activity, where Bahamians should be excluded. If approved, it would mean that the Bahamian business owners would be going up against well-established casinos like the Atlantis and Bahama resorts. Galana said he thinks the market is large enough that there would be strong support even though Bahamians aren't allowed to gamble in casinos. However, he's hoping that the amendments being made to the gaming legislation will provide a level playing field for Bahamians and foreigners. I think it's exacerbated when you allow persons who are perhaps an employee of mine, a person on a work permit, uh, or a permanent resident to have rights that, that in my own country that I don't have. I think that is fundamentally wrong and I think the government would be ill-advised to proceed and I would do everything in my power and in my, my you know, every, I'll use every, every, every ounce, every strength that I have, every ounce of strength that I have to dissuade the government from proceeding along that basis. Furthermore, I'd, go, I'd even go further. I would invite the government to seriously consider whether it shouldn't amend the gaming, the Lotteries and Gaming Act to allow Bahamians at this time to engage in gambling. Uh, we don't have to wait for a referendum. On Wednesday, opposition leader Dr. Hubert Minnis said his personal view is that Bahamians should be allowed to gamble in casinos. However, leading up to the gaming referendum earlier this year, Minnis and the FNM encouraged Bahamians to vote no if they didn't know the answers to questions regarding the regulation and taxation of web shops and the establishment of a national lottery. Galana said today that he's disappointed by Minnis' stance on the issue. But I'm really disappointed by the flip-flop, by his flip-flopping on this, on this issue. I would have thought that if he was really, truly uh, supportive of Bahamian empowerment, he would have not taken the position he did about the gaming referendum. I think he would have told uh, Bahamians or would have advised Bahamians to do what, in our opinion, was the right thing, and that is to legalize this, legislate it, tax it, 
bring it into into the mainstream economy. And so it really is uh, a duplicitous position that Dr. Minnis has taken. In fact, the former Vote Yes campaign spokesman said he also thinks it's very ironic that some of the same people who encouraged Bahamians to vote no leading up to the referendum are at the forefront of the call for equal rights in the proposed gaming bill. They were saying at the, in, on the one hand three months ago that they shouldn't have this opportunity. And now they're saying in an about, a complete about face that they, that they should. Um, I think that what's, what's, what happened, unfortunately, if, if truth be told, is that I think a lot of people might have been confused and maybe we did not do a good job of selling the idea as to why people should vote yes. We thought we did, but perhaps we didn't. And I think now there's a bit of buyer's remorse among those persons who did not vote and those who did not come out and support. And Galana said he's also working with a group seeking to establish a Bahamian-owned bank. Reporting for MB12, I'm Paige McCartney. Minister of Tourism Moby Wilshkam and Minister of Foreign Affairs Fred Mitchell have both recently come out in support of Bahamians being able to own and operate a casino. Well, following months of delays, the National Insurance Board's forensic reports were completed and handed over to government officials weeks ago. Now, there seems to be a delay in their release. The reports were expected to be tabled in Parliament yesterday, but weren't. Opposition leader Dr. Hubert Minnis insists he knows the reason for the holdup. He believes the report's findings are not quite what government expected. Celeste Nixon reports. Minnis said the government is stalling in releasing the forensic reports into the accounts of NIB because they will show that the former FNM administration was effective in their management of the board. We were promised that it would be um, presented to Parliament, be tabled in Parliament. Yesterday, it was not done. I think the report did not bring forth the follies that they wanted. They wanted to show that the FNM was incompetent, the FNM was not doing their job, and reports probably showed that the FNM was on the right track, the FNM was governing properly, and they don't want to bring that forth, and therefore they're delaying. They don't want the public to see that they've spent all this money generating a report, and all the report would show is that the FNM was governing properly. Minnis said he believes had the report contained information damaging to the opposition, it would have been leaked to the public already. If the report was showing negativity, knowing the PLP, even before the report is tabled, knowing their modus operandi, they would have leaked out the negativity. Nothing leaked out. Yesterday in Parliament, Minister of Labor and National Insurance Shane Gibson said he had to delay releasing the two reports in order to give suspended NIB director Alston Cargill an opportunity to examine and review its findings. Minister said Cargill should have been interviewed and his submissions included into the report. Well, they want to give Mr. Cargill an opportunity to read the report so that he can now submit his comments and he can respond to the report. But um, Mr. Cargill was supposed to have done that before. If the report is finished, then the report should be tabled. It's, re it's completed. So now they use an excuse they want to wait for Cargill to review the report, he and his lawyer, so that they can now present a report on top of the report. The probe into NIB was triggered after former NIB chairman Gregory Moss made a series of accusations against Cargill in a 22-page letter last November. Auditors of Grant Thornton examined those allegations, among other matters related to NIB. Gibson said he expects to table the reports in the next 14 days. Reporting for MB12, I'm Celeste Nixon. The former police officer charged with conspiring to smuggle cocaine out of the country has been denied bail. 27-year-old Tony Sweeting, who was discharged from the Royal Bahamas Police Force last month, and her brother, 33-year-old Delano Sweeting, appeared before Senior Justice John Isaacs this morning for a bail hearing. Sweeting, who was wearing all white and hot pink handcuffs, was smiling as she entered the Supreme Court on Bank Lane. Her older sibling is seen here in a white t-shirt and dark blue jeans. The mother of one was denied bail because she is considered a flight risk. However, her brother was granted $21,000 bail with two sureties despite objections from the prosecution. Their attorney, Jomo Campbell, says he was surprised by Justice Isaac's decision and plans to appeal. And her situation is no different from that of a co-accused. Um, there is no indication other than some 
speculation from what was called deemed a, as you would have heard a confidential informant. Um, this applicant is willing to abide by any conditions. Persons have been granted bail for larger quantities of alleged dangerous drugs. Um, so we do intend to appeal in the court of appeal. According to police reports, the former woman police constable was in uniform and on duty when she was arrested at Linden Pinling International Airport in April. More than three pounds of cocaine valued at over $60,000 were found in her possession, according to police. Days later, she and her brother were charged in the magistrate's court. A third person, Conrad Campbell, was charged earlier this week. Sweeting's attorney says it shouldn't matter that his client is a former police officer. He may be a former police officer, however, we did rely on Article 20, um, 2A of the Constitution, which means that everyone is, in fact, presumed innocent unless proven guilty. Officers have been in charge, as you are well aware of, of much more serious offenses than trafficking of drugs and are still at large in the society. So the fact that she is a police officer doesn't in and of itself means that she should not be entitled to be it. Police are looking for the two masked men who forced their way into a man's home and robbed him of his vehicle and other belongings late last night. According to police reports, the Eden Estates resident was standing outside his home after 10 last night when he was approached by two men, one of whom was armed with a handgun. The duo robbed him of cash, a 32-inch flat-screen television, CD player, cell phone and other household items before escaping in his 2002 Chevy Trailblazer. The SUV was later found by police in the High Vista area. Coming up after the break, a prominent physician blasts plans for national health insurance. That story and more after the break.